Hi, my name is Mike Bellevue, and I'm here at uh, Duelist Den North, you might say, um, uh, or at the worldwide headquarters for Duelist 1954, uh, deep in our underground bunker. So I'm, I'm down here in the shop, in other words. And, you know, this is midwinter as I'm recording this, and you may see it years from now, so you wouldn't know that. But if you've been watching right along, you know that Duelist Den is closed for the winter, where I do most of my filming and shooting, my outdoor range, uh, because it's simply inaccessible. It's uh, too far in the woods. When the snow flies, you just can't get in and out of it safely. Um, and unfortunately, because it is midwinter, and midwinters here in Pennsylvania are, are kind of hit or miss, um, and we're in a hit phase right now, in the last week, we've had two more snowstorms. And the first one dropped well over a foot of snow, and the second one was a pretty small one. We got about three or four inches. But the fact of the matter is, not only is Duelist Den inaccessible, but all of the ranges at my uh, three gun clubs are under more than a foot of snow right now. So, shooting videos kind of out of the question for a little while. And I could do more shop videos, you know, I'm still working on the York County flintlock rifle. And I know some of you like those shop videos very much. In, in fact, uh, I'll be honest with you, the shop videos are far uh, from the most popular videos I do. Uh, but the people who like them really like them a lot. And as long as you like them, I'll keep doing them. But I've learned from better experience that if I do a bunch of them together, and that's all you see for a month or so, uh, I just lose subscribers. Um, so we need to vary things up. So I, I want to try something a little bit different today. I can't get out shooting, so I want to do a kind of a discussion video. I'll give you a, kind of a historical perspective on things. And... You know, like I say, I've, I've not done that before. I'm, uh, I've been very unhappy with most of the tabletop type videos I've seen on YouTube. And I, I said, you know, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but here I am, you know, I'm buried under, <laughs> under over a foot of snow. And we got to do something. And there is a subject I wanted to talk to you about. And I think you'll find it interesting. I hope you will. And what I want to talk about is everyday carry in the cap and ball era. Right? And, uh, and that might not be exactly what you think it's going to be. So, uh, with, without further ado, well, let's get into our subject. Everyday carry in the cap and ball era. So, for a lot of us, when we think about everyday carry in the cap and ball era, uh, we tend to think in terms of guns like this, right? Like this Remington 44 caliber New Model Army. And, and... I think a lot of us think about these because we have a natural bias towards either the cowboy era uh, or towards the Civil War, right? Because uh, those are the things that we are most likely to see movies about or read history books about. Uh, those are the kind of romantic eras that bring us to cap and ball. So we think about these things. Right? And... To be honest with you, there's some truth to that, but it's a lot more nuanced than you might think. And that's what I hope we can get into today, because everyday carry in the cap and ball era was as nuanced as it is today. So today in the 21st century, everyday carry for a working police officer means something quite different than everyday carry uh, for an urban professional, let's say, <laughs> or an urban bike messenger. Uh, and it means something different than everyday carry for, say, a large landowner uh, who spends a lot of time out in the woods or in his fields, uh, or for a guide in Grizzly Bear Company, right? All of those people have different needs. And in the 19th century, you found the same thing. So out west... Out on the frontier, everyday carry would have meant something quite different than it would have for a citizen of, say, Five Points neighborhood 
uh, now I think Hell's Kitchen, right? Five, five Points neighborhood in Manhattan, say in 1855 or 1866. Uh, and it would have meant something quite different than it would have for a cowboy on Cattle Drive in 1866. All right, so uh, let's take a look at some of the different everyday carry options and who would have been likely to be doing that. Okay, so Patterson Colts were the first successful, shall we say, uh, single barrel revolvers. But they weren't very successful and their main use as everyday carry pieces were by early Texas Rangers where, where they were quite successful but overall they had very little impact on everyday carry. And the period where Patterson's would have been prevalent, uh, there were other everyday carry options, which I'm going to tell you a little bit later in the video. But if, if we move on down to these guys, walkers and dragoons, I'm also going to rule these out for everyday carry pieces because they're simply too big. Now, I'm not going to say that you wouldn't have found some people carrying these things. I'm sure you would have. Uh... And, and famously in movies and books, right? Gus McRae of Lonesome Dove fame. In the book, he carried one of these, a Dragoon. In the movie, he carried a walker uh, converted to fire cartridges, of course. Um, so, obviously, some people believe that people would have been carrying those around, but you just, most people just would not carry a three or four pound six gun on their belt. These things were mostly carried in horse holsters. And in fact, on the plains, this gun was quite popular, but it was popular for buffalo hunting from horseback. And, and it was carried by the horse, not by the man. Okay, so, so these things were pretty much out for everyday carry pieces. But there were uses for full-size guns. And uh, let's talk about that. Right, when it comes to full-sized six guns, the Colt Navy Revolver, 36 caliber, 1851. This was the king of all six guns during the cap and ball era. Uh, it was the first really practical holster pistol developed. And it revolutionized things. And these were carried by lawmen, they were carried by bad men. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite stories about using one of these was uh, Uncle Dick Wooten. And he was a former mountain man during the beaver trapping era of mountain men. And then he settled down in New Mexico and Colorado and became an entrepreneur. And uh, one of the businesses that he started was a freight company hauling goods on the uh, Santa Fe Trail. And the Santa Fe Trail basically, in the pre-railroad days, linked the manufacturing capability of the eastern United States uh, and the importing capability of the eastern United States to bring things in from Europe. Right? Uh, it linked those goods to the western marketplace in New Mexico, in Santa Fe, which was uh, its western terminus. So these were, you know, ox-drawn wagon trains that had to traverse a thousand miles of extremely dangerous country. And they were prone to Indian attack, they were prone to attack by uh, bad men who wanted to take for their own what other people had earned. So when Uncle Dick Wooten went out hiring Teamsters, the kind of men he looked for, and, and his autobiography is something that is absolutely wonderful to read, and I absolutely recommend it. Uh, but what he looked for are, as he said, men who knew what their guns were for. In other words, men who didn't hesitate to shoot when it was time to pull the trigger. Which, which by the way, most people do. Yeah, we kind of have an in internal bias against killing our fellow human beings. You have to overcome that. Well, Uncle Dick was looking for guys who had overcome that already. And, and he outfitted all of them with one of these Colt Navy revolvers. 
Uh, and in fact, he used one of these himself when he had an insurrection among his his teamsters. Uh, and he used he used his Colt Navy to put it down. So these were very popular. I mean, as far as uh, famous characters, of course, we've got uh, Wild Bill Hickok, who famously carried a pair of these uh, right up until the cattle drive days. So this gun was used, but it was used pretty specifically by people who could get away with carrying a seven and a half inch revolver. Uh, and that was a specific class of people. It might have been uh, lawmen uh, who could wear their guns in town because, you know, in a lot of the boom towns of the West, uh, they, the towns had ordinances against carrying handguns or any guns in town. I mean, we think of gun control as being something of, uh, you know, imposed by the, the liberal elite um, in modern times, but, you know, in times past... When a town's livelihood depended on fleecing transient workers who were flush with money and plying them with large amounts of alcohol and then, uh, and then teasing them with sexual, uh, sexual favors and fleecing them at gambling, well, you didn't necessarily want those guys packing heat when they figured out that the money that it took them two or three months to earn on the trail or or, you know, a week of hard work in the mines was all gone and they weren't going weren't gonna to have anything to bring home with them. So a lot of towns didn't let you carry these unless you were the town marshal, in which case you could wear it outside of your coat, right? You could wear it on a holster or what Bill Hickok did, tucked in a sash. Uh, and that was the sort of person who carried this. Now, as time went on, we got a couple of other guns that... Uh, that supplanted this with a lot of people right at the end of the Cap'n Ball era. So here we've got the 1860 Colt Army Revolver. It's got an 8-inch barrel. Right? This, this gun was extremely popular. It was the most purchased gun by the Union during the Civil War. And a lot of these made the trip west. Uh, and in fact, this was the most popular six gun during the cattle drive era. Uh, probably more popular than the Colt Navy. Uh, though a lot of the cowboys did have Colt Navies because Confederate soldiers, when they demobilized, got to take their guns with them. And uh, the most popular sidearm in the Confederate Army was the 36 caliber Colt Navy. Now, a lot of people point out all the many Confederate manufactured arms, Griswold and Gunnarsson, Leach and Risgen, uh, Danson Brothers, Spiller and Burr, and on and on and on, right? But all of their production combined was a drop in the bucket compared to the Colt Navy. Um, in fact, the Colt Navy, just let me grab this, the Colt Navy had... Uh, well over a quarter million guns produced between 1850 and 1873. And the Colt 1860 Army was just a bit behind that, with just a bit over 200,000 guns produced uh, during that same period. This is a gun that went west with a lot of people. And who carried these? Well, for the most part, outdoorsmen, right? Cowboys, scouts, uh, lawmen, certainly, prospectors, um, folks who were going to be outside could get away with wearing a belt and holster with a big eight inch barrel gun in it. Uh, and for those people, this was it. And for law enforcement officers, you know, town marshals, military, anybody who appreciated hard-hitting firepower, in other words, people who were extremely likely to need to use their guns, not just to deter an attack, but to actually defeat an attack, like to have a gun like this. Right, so those are the folks who used these kind of guns for everyday carry. Now, not to give it short shrift while we're talking about the Colts, the Remington New Model Army was also a very popular gun out west. The fact of the matter is, Remington 
only produced about half of these guns as Colt did with the new model army. That's just the way it is. And in fact, Remington made most of their sales when a Colt, when a fire at the Colt facility towards the end of the Civil War uh, put Colt out of business for almost a year, making Remington the major game in town. And, uh, and they absolutely made hay while the sun shined. Um, people love Remingtons today, and I, I think it's because of the stolid frame. The sighting system is much more like sighting systems that people are used to today. Um, the fact is, Colts were more popular during the cap and ball era. That's just the way it is. Uh, now, Remington, uh, to their credit, saw a market that Colt did not, and that was cartridge conversions. And at the end of the Civil War, Remington bit the bullet and licensed the roll and white patent for board through cylinders from Smith and Wesson. And Remington converted a lot of their cap and ball percussion guns to fire cartridges. And that's kind of a subject for another day, but, but the fact is that that and the Remington rolling block rifle are two things that really helped to keep Remington going and out of bankruptcy because you could buy one of these used after the Civil War for about $1.25, uh, whereas a new one went for about $12. But they couldn't sell new ones, <laughs> just couldn't, because you could pick these up everywhere for like $1.25. Right? So it really crushed the arms market. So Remington intelligently took most of their stock of cap and ball revolvers after the war and converted them to cartridges, and they sold very well. And Colt didn't do that because they didn't want to pay for the Roland White uh, patent. They didn't want to pay Smith & Wesson a licensing fee. So they largely waited. They, they tried something called the Thor conversion, which was not very successful at all. Uh, but they largely waited until the patent expired, and then they got into it. And Remington had been making hay with these all along, so they had a pretty good market. Now the problem is, Remington was complacent, and they had so much stock, these cotton ball revolvers, to convert, that they did not develop a made-for-cartridge handgun until after Colt developed the single-action army revolver and really kicked Remington's butt. And that failure to anticipate the market actually cost Remington the big bore handgun market for the rest of the century. Right? But for a while, they were definitely making hay with these guys uh, of all sizes. Okay, so everyday carry in a full size gun, fairly limited, limited uh, to lawmen, soldiers. Um, and professional outdoorsmen of one stripe or another, cowboys, miners, Indian scouts, that sort of thing. But for the general population, not everyday carry. So, why weren't those guns everyday carry? Well, because the barrels were seven and a half inches to eight inches long. And just like now, even though in the 19th century they tended to wear more voluminously cut clothes, uh, particularly our era of the 19th century that we're talking about. I mean, if we went back to the early 19th century Regency era, I mean, you could hardly uh, conceal a snuff box in those clothes. People's clothes were cut so tight. But later in the century, uh, sack coats were common, uh, clothes were, were looser, but still, those were big guns to conceal. However, people who knew their guns wanted guns that had some power and the smaller guns had correspondingly less power. So what we found during the cap and ball era were full-size guns like this being cut down to short-barreled guns like this. Now the benefit of a gun like this is that it delivered full power, right? In this case, 44 caliber, uh, 1860 Army. It delivered full size gun power in a portable package. 
And these were extremely popular, and they went by different names. They, they were called Avenging Angels, or they were called Belly Guns, but they were quite popular. And amazingly enough, uh, even very large guns could be cut down. So in this case, a full-size Colt Dragoon was cut down by uh, U.S. Deputy Marshal um, William Stokes to make a snub-nosed gun, and he used that to arrest John D. Lee in, in Utah. And the fact is, these cut-down Colts uh, of whatever model were incredibly common in the 19th century. I mean, you can easily find hundreds of these things uh, in books, you can find them in museums, that they were done very, very often, and they were quite popular. These were true everyday carry guns. Now, this gun, which I've dubbed the Remington Bulldog, is my take on the same sort of thing, a belly gun, built on a Remington platform. Uh, now, these are a lot of fun, and I know, you know, I've showed how to build these, and, and other people have done it. But, what I'm going to say is probably going to be disappointing to Remington fans. I have never found a single historical example of an actual cut-down Remington belly gun. Now, I'm not saying they didn't exist. I'm sure they must have. Somebody must have done this. And anybody who can send me pictures of an original... Uh, I would love to see it, because I'm just not finding them. So, I can find dozens upon dozens upon dozens of examples of Colts that are cut down like that. Uh, and not Remington. So I would say these were not common for everyday carry. Those guns, full-size guns and short guns based on full-size guns, they had specific uses and there were people who carried those every day. They were not the most common everyday carry guns in use. And uh, some of the more common guns are going to be maybe a surprise to you. Now certainly before Colt revolvers became the predominant weapon, and before any revolvers became the predominant weapon, you had single shot percussion derringers. And these guns were used in their multitudes. They were extremely popular. And actually, they remained extremely popular even in the revolver period, right? even in the age of multiple shots, because they were very small, they were very concealable, and they fired a potent round. Uh, in fact, John Wilkes Booth used one of these, to assassinate President Abraham Lincoln in 1865. And, and certainly, there were many revolver options available then, but it was highly concealable. He only needed one shot, uh, and it did the trick. And these were guns that a lot of people carried. A lot of people carried. Uh, they were carried more as a deterrent, because obviously you only had one shot. Right? They were a good deterrent, because if somebody held you up, they didn't want that one shot to be in them. Right, So that's a gun that could be used to convince someone to curtail an attack. And, and they certainly were used in that way. Uh, they're not particularly good offensive weapons, so if you were, if you were a gangster bent on uh, you know, robbing somebody, well, that would work. Um, particularly if they were not interested in, in being robbed when they were dead. Uh, but you only had the one shot. Uh, but lots of people must have carried them. There were thousands of these things made by gunsmiths all over the United States. Uh, and they were made for years. So, very popular option. Definitely was an everyday carry gun for many people. The, the other kind of surprising class of guns is pepper box revolvers. And these predated um, the Colt Navy and Colt Dragoon in many cases. They're, they're kind of coincident um, with the Patterson. But unlike the Patterson with a fixed barrel and a revolving cylinder, the barrel 
and cylinder were the same. So the cylinders were long and there were actually multiple barrels joined together. Uh, they were kind of hard to shoot. They are difficult to aim because obviously the barrel is moving so you couldn't mount sights on it. But they were effective everyday carry guns. Uh, a lot of them were double action. There were some single action ones but a lot of them were double action which meant you could draw them and pull the trigger and they were going to go off. So if, if you were, you know, card table distance, they could be a handy little option. Now they got, could get kind of bulky, but most of them were pretty small caliber, 28 to 31, some 36s. You didn't get many that were big, big bores. Uh, they often had six barrels, sometimes only four. Um, and they were quite popular even into the actual revolver age. Though by the Civil War, they were definitely losing their luster. But in the pre-Civil War era of cap and ball, these pepper boxes were very common everyday carry guns. Right? Kind, of, uh, kind of surprising. But they weren't as big as the huge horse pistols that dominated the early cap and ball revolver days. They gave you multiple shots and they could be relatively easily concealed, though certainly not as well as the class of guns that were coming up. Uh, so they weren't really as popular as the single shot Derringers that we've been looking at, uh, which really were uh, far and away for the first Oh, first 30 years of the um, percussion era, they were the most popular everyday carry guns. Okay, well this brings us to the, ta -da 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 -da, uh, to the big winner for the everyday carry gun of the Cap'n Ball era. And that was the model 1849 Colt pocket revolver. 31 caliber, five shot, came out at the same time as the Colt Navy. This was Colt's best selling cap and ball revolver. 340,000 of these little guns were sold by Colt. The beauty of them is obvious. They're small. They can seal well. They gave you five shots. The firepower might not be tremendous in terms of the oomph of that 31 caliber projectile. However, very few people want to get shot with anything, even a 31 caliber, or actually 32 caliber ball. Uh, getting shot is not on most people's agenda. Therefore, shove this in their face and they might rethink whatever ill they were going to do you. So this is the type of gun that was carried by denizens of towns and cities all over the country, not just in the East. So you would have found these uh, with a uh, New York City gangster in Five Points, and you would have found them with a banker in Dodge City or Abilene, Kansas. Right? They, uh, they were all over the place. Now, obviously, they're not long-range guns. They're not guns that plainsmen are going to be shooting buffalo with. But when it comes to everyday carry, just like now, where you'll find uh, small semi-automatic pistols, right, pocket pistols, as they're called, are by far more likely to be carried as are, say, small J-frame uh, double-action revolvers, snub-nosed revolvers, far more likely to be carried than a full-size Glock or a full-size 1911. Um, people carry what they can carry every day. So I know a lot of you guys are saying, well, what about the Remington, the 1863 Pocket? This little cutie right here. Well, okay. Uh, this was certainly made to be the competitor to Colt's 1849 pocket revolver. It's also a 31 caliber, single action, five shot. 
Uh, has a spur trigger, no trigger guard. I don't like that much, but a lot of people do. That's okay. Um, so why don't I count this as, as you know, the most popular everyday carry guns? And, and a lot of people, I'm sure, did carry them, by the way. I'm not going to disparage it. Uh, however, only 25,000 of these were made by Remington, as opposed to 340,000 of the Colt Pocket model. So just in terms of how many people had their hands on one of these is much less than the people who had the Colt. Now Remington also made a police revolver, 36 caliber, just like Colt did. Uh, and, and in fact, that is one of my favorite Remingtons. I have an original uh, of that, but it's, um, it's a cartridge conversion, as so many of the Remington guns were. But they only made about 18,000 of those. So even if you put them together, you're less than 50,000 of the small Remingtons uh, as compared to, you know, well over 300,000 of the small Colts. So, the Colt uh, pocket model is the king of everyday carry in the cap and ball era of the 19th century. Well, you know, here we are with our 19th century everyday carry piece. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's something a little bit different. I prefer to do shooting myself, right? Well, not shooting myself, but for me to do some shooting. Uh, and I'd like to get back to that. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this. And if you did, uh, you know, there are other topics that we can do. and uh, Certainly you can request topics if you liked it. So if you like it, give it a big thumbs up. Right? We, we hope that you'll uh, subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. And uh, if you want to support the channel on Patreon, it's much appreciated it's how we get a lot of the stuff that we get to do these videos. So, hopefully, uh, you can help out. But if you can't, that's fine. The most important thing, uh, to me anyway, is that you watch them and you enjoy them. So, let me know in the comments if this worked for you. And uh, if it did, and you want to see more, I've got some ideas. I mean, I'd like to do a similar thing on what constituted a police gun in the 19th century. And, you know, I would hope that, uh, that you would enjoy that. And there are probably other things that you would like to see. And if there are, let me know. So please, comments are going to be very important on this one because, like I say, we're trying something different. And if it doesn't work, I got to know so I don't subject you to more of them. And if it does work, I got to know because, well, I'll, I'll do others when the snow's flying in between doing shop videos. So um, that's all from me. And we'll see you next week. Bye.